It's no secret that Cuphead is a fantastic game due to its incredible art style and amazing soundtrack, but easily the best part of the game is the lineup of bosses. This game has easily one of my favorite boss rosters in just about any game that I play, and it's what allows me to keep coming back in case I just want to have some quick fun. But of course, not all bosses are created equally, and as a result, some of them are nearly flawless, but others can be a bit underwhelming and or frustrating. So that's my mission for today, as I rank all 25 bosses from my least favorite to my favorite. I will mainly just be judging these bosses based on their fight, as that's the most important part of any boss. I'll be taking design, personality, and music into consideration as well, but they won't be as impactful as the battle. I also will not be ranking the King's Leap, as they are a huge far cry from the main bosses in the game and are optional. The last rule is that I will not be considering any of the secret phases for this list, as not really many people care about them. At least that's what I think. In addition, this is entirely my own opinion, and my opinion will very likely not be the same as yours. For this list especially, expect some serious controversy with a few spots. But I also want to address one more thing. As someone who has 300% this game twice, no boss in this game is absolutely rage inducing to me anymore. So therefore, the lower entries will simply just be lower as they are not as interesting as the higher spots. With all that said, let's get this list going, as this is going to be a long one. My name is Phoenix, and this is All Bosses in Cuphead, ranked from worst to best. Let's go. I'm sure some of you are taking guesses as to what bosses will be where on this list, and I'm also very sure that at least two-thirds of you who are doing that got this first guess wrong. But all jokes aside, I don't think it's much of an argument to be made that Gooby Legrand is the most bland boss in the game. Design-wise, anyone could draw him in under a minute, and personality-wise, he doesn't seem to have much aside from being extremely narcissistic. The music is just alright, but it's his battle that puts him all the way down here at the bottom. Yes, some bosses have phases that can be considered frustrating, but in reality, it's better than what Goopy brings, which is almost nothing. In his first phase, all he does is bounce around the screen back and forth, which just takes a sip with Ash to get out of the way. He may also lunge at you, but it's easily duckable if you somehow can't get out of range. Well, what about the second phase? He eats a jelly bean and doubles in size, then proceeds to do exactly the same thing as the first phase, bouncing back and forth and occasionally stopping to throw a punch. The one slightly interesting part is the final phase. A gravestone splats his body, and now he slides back and forth and tries to smash you, even in his grave situation. This isn't too bad for an early boss, but the whole fight is extremely easy and repetitive, to the point where just about anyone can beat it within a couple tries after learning it. Admittedly, I have faced off against worse fights in other games, but this is easily my least favorite boss for being the most uninteresting. Not much else to say here, I guess. For a first boss, the Root Pack is a great introduction to the game, but they also simply just don't stand up to the many other bosses you'll be facing. Design-wise, they're quite simple. A potato, an onion, and a carrot, all of which with a noticeably different personality. One cranky, one very sensitive, I guess, and one who's a little kooky. The fight itself is a great introduction to many of the things you'll be working to master over the course of the game, and it leads these vegetables to being one of my personal favorite first bosses in all the video games, despite being near the bottom of this list. Up first is Sal Sputter, who follows a very simple attack pattern, that being three mud balls and a worm that you can parry. After taking him out, next up is Ollie Bulb, who isn't very happy about being dragged into this fight, as his own tears rain down upon you, making you pay attention to the projectiles coming from the top of the screen instead of moving horizontally. Lastly is Chauncey Chantanay, I may have totally butchered that pronunciation, but anyway, he will make homing torpedo carrots that follow you around, occasionally stopping to fire a psychic laser out of his third eye. This phase teaches you all about lock-on and homing attacks and ultimately wraps up the tutorial boss. Overall, the execution of this boss is done fantastically, but it falls this low simply because of first boss syndrome. While the fight and music are great, it's only to set you up for the remaining bosses, but even despite all of that, these roots all do their jobs very well. I'm gonna go eat some Miss Vicky's, I'll be right back. There's a couple bosses in this game that aren't ranked low because I dislike them, but instead they didn't really click with me. Ribby and Croaks is a perfect example of this, for lack of a better word, lack of chemistry. And yes, I'm aware that these two frogs were meant to reference the Street Fighter series, but as I have never played Street Fighter, this went over my head. Design-wise, I do respect the reference, though they're not the most interesting compared to later bosses. Personality-wise, they don't really show a whole lot aside from wanting to be the tough guy. And the music for this fight is just okay. Maybe I'm just missing something with this fight, but like I said, it didn't really click with me. But as for the fight itself, it does a pretty good job at testing you of all the skills you learned previously, such as dodging fast moving attacks and taking out minions in the first phase, dealing with attacks from both sides in the second phase, and even throwing a unique gimmick at you with a slot machine in the last phase. And the last phase is the most interesting part of this fight for a reason, as in this phase, you can only directly damage them after parrying the lever. 
And no two fights will go exactly the same, since there are three different colored platforms that it can distribute, with each of their different speed and form. While I have to look pretty hard to find my enjoyment in this fight, this last phase definitely helps. However, it isn't enough for me to rank it any higher. Better luck next time, I guess. There's one more boss that doesn't really resonate with me at all, but this time, it's quite a bit more interesting. However, Sally's stage play ends up getting bogged down for another reason. Her design is alright, but still very simple, although we don't go up against many humans in this game, so it is unique to say the least. Although, her personality is a little one-sided, as it's clear she enjoys being in the spotlight. Gee, who does that remind you of? <laughs> but jokes aside, this fight suffers from a glaring issue, and that's just simply the fact that it's too easy. Seriously, this is likely one of the last fights that you'll do in IL-3, and you're most likely going to have fought Dr. Kyle's robot before this, and the difficulty of this fight completely drops through the stage. The first phase takes place in the wedding hall as Sally blows kisses, throws a fan trap, pile drives you, and then disappears into her umbrella to drop down from the top of the screen. The issue with this, however, is that most of these attacks are repeated in the second phase with some minor changes such as the wind-up mice and bottles of milk being thrown out of the windows of the house. But fundamentally speaking, your strategy should not change much in this phase, if at all. Phase 3 sees Sally herself disappear from the stage as you fight a goddess cutout of herself as she summons a bunch of natural phenomena which are just simply stage props. And in her last phase, Sally hangs from the ceiling as the crowd tosses roses on the stage, all while Sally's umbrella follows you around. While the scenery and music of this fight are both very nice, the lack of difficulty is what really puts this performance down. Enter stage right, exit stage left. Out of all of the bosses in this game, there are three in particular that come to mind when people talk about their least favorites in this game. And while I don't personally agree with all of it, I can see where they're coming from, although in reality it is just a big ol' skill issue. With Rumor Honeybottoms, however, I can't deny that there are moments where she can be a frustration maker. In terms of her design, she is one of the more basic designs, just being the Queen Bee. And while Honeycomb Herald is one of my more favorite music pieces in this game, her personality doesn't really do it for me. Judging by her death screen, it's clear that she doesn't know the real reason why we're here. We're here for her soul contract, not her honey. I don't mind having a more fleshed out personality, but being oblivious isn't what I have in mind. But her fight can definitely be frustrating for a lot of the wrong reasons, mainly in the first two phases. The first phase with the policeman B isn't too bad, but if you're trying to get three parries by the end, good luck. Because we're constantly jumping upwards through the whole fight, it really throws a monkey wrench in terms of getting even one parry as quite often I jump up to get one, and the platform gets in the way, making me take a hit. The second phase is also quite janky in places, specifically with her triangle attack. The pink orbs and bullet beals aren't too bad, but the triangle spawns directly on top of you and follows the direction you're moving, so it can be a tricky to avoid if you get backed into a wall. It also doesn't help how the final phase can be almost completely skipped, as there isn't a damage gate between the second and third phases, so you could get to the last phase and have nothing happen before a knockout. I guess this isn't a bad thing, but it can be a bit anticlimactic after what we just went through. I've gotten to the point where I don't really struggle with any bosses anymore, but this one still remains tough for me to this day. Bee stings really are the worst. Bosses fought in an airplane are very different than those fought on foot, but a trade-off of having much more free movement means that the game will throw a lot more projectiles at you at once, as it's now a proper bullet hell scenario. But it's fair to say that Dr. Call's robot goes a little bit overboard even for the last world of the base game. Design-wise, this boss is just about perfect for this art style, and while it's hard to find the personality of this boss, as it is a robot, I do appreciate how expressive he is. In addition, Junkyard Jive is easily one of my favorite music pieces from the base game, but in terms of the fight, oh goodness, it's a mess. Just in the first phase, there's already a lot going on, even before the player can get their bearings. A massive laser that blocks your shots, this telly look-alike that you need to parry to shut down, and whatever these things are that snake upwards from the bottom of the screen. You'd think that destroying these weapons would shut it down for good, but instead it's replaced by another weapon that can't be destroyed. Those being a spread shot cannon, twisty hands, and worst of all, these stupid homing bombs. After destroying each of the first three weapons, and the robot's heart, the head flies out and you'll need to shoot it down. This doesn't sound too bad, but you'll have more bombs to deal with and very limited chances to actually attack the head, especially since you can't shoot backwards while on the plane. And then there's the last phase. Easily one of the messiest phases in the whole game, Dr. Call pulls out a Chaos Emerald lookalike and forces you into the most brutal bullet hell phase in the whole game. The projectiles themselves aren't that bad to dodge, but it gets worse when having to navigate around these electric walls, and it gets even worse as the foreground will likely be obstructing your vision at the worst possible time. But the worst part is the incessant cackling throughout this entire phase. It's not as bad as Ice Reef, but it still isn't very pleasant on the ears. 
I appreciate the adrenaline rush that this fight provides, but it definitely throws you in the deep end a little too quickly at times. I think I need to go in for repairs after this. This next one is going to be a mouthful. It's also likely one of the most controversial opinions on this list, but I need to be honest here. King Dice is a bunch of amazing and a bunch of absolutely garbage at the same time. The dice head himself stops you on your way to the devil, and he's not letting you pass through easily. Firstly, I love King Dice's personality and design. TBH, one year I may dress up as him for Halloween, but in terms of his fight, this has to be the most tedious fight in the game because of its sheer length. The fight starts with King Dice summoning a dice that you'll need to parry, which will roll anywhere from 1 to 3. There are spaces on the craps table labeled with a digit from 1 to 9, and each one corresponds to a mini boss, and you'll need to face up against at least 3 of these 9 mini bosses to get to square up with the square headed man. The Tipsy Troop is a group of 3 glasses of alcohol, all with their own unique attack. Chip's bed again just simply translates across the screen in segments that you'll need to dash or duck through. Oh yeah, he also does this. Right. Mr. Wheezy spits out spiraling fireballs, but also occasionally switches ashtrays, forcing you to jump to the other one. Pippa Dot spit out a lot of D20s and occasionally spawn a domino bird, but you'll need to face him on a moving floor covered in spikes. Hoppa's focus can definitely be a frustration maker since dodging his skull ring can be tough without the smoke bomb. Fear Lap isn't too bad, but the foreground doesn't like to play nice. Pirouletta wouldn't be too bad on paper, but I've had a few runs in here because I got duped. Dapper Blob, er, sorry, Mangosteen, is a joke and a half. And Mr. Jimes, I wouldn't bother with. Each mini boss is interesting enough, but having to fight a minimum of three just to get here, with the risk of having to do more than that thanks to the start over tile right before the finish line, can make this fight quite tedious to get through, which makes losing all the more crushing. King Dice himself doesn't do much but send out rows of cars that you need to parry jump off of in order to not get hit, but doing that while shooting can get your intents twisted a bit so it can be easy to slip, especially when you've been working for at least three minutes already just to get to this point. It's even more crushing when you're trying to S-rank him, which makes this fight one of the most miserable to get through, especially when you came inches away from the finish line, only to choke and have to start from the very beginning. You had a lot of potential, Dice said, but I'll opt out of this game, if you don't mind. The Delicious Last Course was an excellent expansion to the base game, and the bosses featured in this, while few, were all excellent standouts compared to the base game. But there has to be that one guy that comes in last, and that one guy is Glumson the Giant. It's not necessarily his fault, but I have a little bit of beef with him, mostly due to expert mode. His theme is alright, though his design and personality are all very well done, although I imagine having that stony carrot base isn't very comfortable. And while he is a little bit cranky after getting a pickaxe to his tooth, it's clear that he does care about his garden. Oh, and the gnomes are hilarious. But the fight can get a bit cluttered in places, and there are some moments that make you feel like getting hit wasn't really your fault. In the first phase, Glimstone will reveal a cauldron in his mouth that spews out gas clouds, in addition to calling a flock of geese and grabbing a bear. I personally don't want to know where that came from. In addition, you'll be standing on five platforms that raise and lower themselves, and some will also collapse as the first phase goes on, and underneath are some gnomes that are acting like caltrops. After ripping his beard off, ouch, Glumstone will then toss a ball between two puppets on his hands as gnomes do acrobatics. But after getting even more angry, he breaks the platform that you're standing on and swallows you whole, and the last phase happens inside of his stomach. Gross. You'll be on five more platforms in the form of skeletal reptiles as turkey legs and bones are spat out of, uh, and you'll have to stay active to watch for the platform that opens its mouth. As fun as this fight can be, it's hard to ignore the fact that there's a bit of a BS factor that shows up in expert mode. The first phase is insanely luck dependent if you want to get through without taking any dumb hits. Sometimes you could end up in situations such as, oh, I don't know, a platform raising itself as geese are flying above your head, lifting you straight into the hazard zone, or this rightmost platform almost always being the first that collapses, leaving you to get completely boxed in with no safe place to stand as Glumstone grabs his bear for just long enough so that you can't avoid taking a hit. Yeah, things like that can just happen sometimes. Either way, aside from that, this fight is extremely solid and a great introduction to the DLC, but we can only go up from here. Although, we're on top of a mountain, so... RNG is an important part of keeping any boss in this game engaging, which some bosses do better than others. But to be completely randomized can be a blessing or a curse if handled haphazardly. With Baroness Von Bonbon, bon, it's definitely hit and miss. The Baroness herself doesn't even make an appearance until the end of the fight, although her henchmen are ready. She definitely shows that she is willing to stand her ground during her last stand, and the music for Sugarland Shimmy is very enjoyable to listen to. The fight itself can go a few ways, as getting minions like Colonel Von Pop and Mofsky Chernikov isn't really favorable. But on the other hand, Lord Gompacker, Sergeant Gumball Gumball, and Sir Waffington III aren't too bad, so you'll want to see these guys whenever possible. From dodging a random gumballs, two chunks of a waffle, two splashes of cupcake frosting, while fighting these guys off, you'll need to be on the lookout for Jelly Bean's soldiers, and as the third minion comes out, the Baroness herself will try to take a pot shot at you. 
After defeating the third minion, Bon Bon sits atop Whippet Cream Puff and chases you down, as she throws her head at you while Whippet spins mint boulders at you. It's an intense last phase that keeps you on your toes as you jump from the ground to the green candy platform and back again. Truth be told, I don't have much to say about this boss, but this is the first fight that really manages to be fun, despite revolving around RNG a bit too much in the beginning. Now where's my Swedish fish? As an introduction to the aeroplane, Hildeberg was a fantastic first shmup in addition to being visually very pleasing. Design-wise, what am I even looking at? A girl with a weather vane on her head that turns into a blimp powered by a unicycle, and then turns into various constellations, and then into the moon? Definitely the most quirky design in the game, and that's not something you'll see me complain about. And while I'm not the biggest fan of the theme for this fight, her quirky personality and design makes up for that. And as for the fight, it does a great job at teaching you what to expect when you climb into the cockpit and take to the air. She starts off in her blimp form as she laughs at you, and smaller zeppelin minions appear to take a shot at you. After taking some damage, she will transform into the first of two constellations, which will be Taurus on regular and Gemini on expert. Taurus will occasionally try to headbutt you, and Gemini will send a flaming orb onto your side, which makes a line of lasers circle around it, making you circle it to avoid damage. After changing back into a blimp, you'll now see green zeppelins in addition to tornadoes that will loosely magnetize themselves to you. The second constellation can be either Gemini or Sagittarius on regular, depending on how much damage you do, but it will always be Sagittarius on expert, and Sagittarius isn't messing around. He will fire a golden arrow at you, in addition to three homing stars that will chase you around until destroyed or enough time has passed. The fifth phase is a culmination of what you've seen in phases 1 and 3, but things really crank up in phase 6. After whatever transformation sequence this is, you're now fighting the literal moon as stars travel towards you, and after Hilda ejects her face, UFOs will come out and hit you with a laser with different timings. Overall, this fight is visually one of the best in the game, and as one of the first bosses, Hilda does a fantastic job. But we still have 15 more bosses to go. It's been foretold that things are about to get really good now, has it not? It can be difficult to make some bosses work with their own gimmick, but also just as hard to make them engaging if their main gimmick is simply just projectile spam. However, Captain Brinybeard manages to stay engaging even though his main gimmick is, in fact, projectile spam. In terms of his design, Bluto here definitely checks the box for a pirate, but having his own living ship is also a nice touch. His personality is also very fitting for a pirate, and he proves to be pretty confident as he stands his ground. Now as for the fight, it slowly escalates over time, as Brinybeard starts by just firing pellets out of an octopus, but there's also a barrel at the top of the screen that will slam down as you're underneath it. After a while, Brinybeard will then whistle for his friends, as Dogfish, a Squid, and a Shark all answer the call to come ambush you. After another while, the ship itself will then attack you by spitting cannonballs, but soon the fight takes a turn as Brinybeard is tossed off his ship and into the ocean, leaving only the ship left as it spits out looping fireballs and a massive pink laser that you can parry off of. The barrel, however, is still there even after all of this, so if you choose to duck, just be aware of that. But if you choose to parry, be prepared to have your heart ring maxed out and to have a lot of fun as you juggle yourself. The one thing that I find that holds this fight back is just the fact that the barrel doesn't ever go away at any point. And because most people don't focus on the top of the screen, it's pretty easy to miss the barrel falling. Alright, now I gotta go fish him out. The final boss of any video game is incredibly important, and while he isn't my favorite, the devil does a great job at rounding out a fantastic game. Now we're really on the heat of it, as we take our battle all the way to Inkwell Hell and square off against the one who sent us on our mission to begin with. His sinister design and personality and intense music should be enough to give you a clear sign that you're really in for one hell of a time. The fight slowly starts to get more tense as it goes on, starting in the Devil's Throne Room as he claps his hands together, extends his neck towards the edges of the room, drops his head from the ceiling, and sends various numbers of blue fireballs, all while these little devils peek out from behind the throne and then run across the floor. But after taking enough damage, the devil jumps out of his skin and through the floor, where you then follow him. It's clear that he's done messing around, as instead of the solid floor we just came from, now we get five small platforms to jump between. Now the devil will summon spinning axes and a parryable bomb bat, and make sure you parry that, or else... <laughs> after taking more damage, the two outer platforms will collapse, and now he will summon these little bats, and whatever these guys are, to shoot skulls at you. And after taking more damage, he will start to cry, as the number of platforms goes down to only one, as a stream of parryable tears fall from the devil's eyes. While all of this is happening, flaming poker chips will fall onto the platforms, so you can't stay in one place forever. While I do enjoy this fight, it's not personally my favorite, as some attacks can feel pretty cheap, especially the clapping attack in the first phase and the falling poker chip in the last phase. Either way, it's a satisfying way to end the game and put this demon in his place. And now we're going to go do some baking. 
If there's any boss in this game that got a good laugh out of me, it would have to be another one that takes us in the plane. Jimmy the Great really is a great guy when it comes to the charm of this fight, but the fight itself can be a little annoying for the wrong reasons. Design-wise, he is one of the more simple designs, but in terms of his personality, it is clear that he is messing with you, as he pulls out various tricks throughout all five phases of this fight. The first phase begins with him pulling out a treasure chest that sends out sphinx cats, scimitars, or jewelry, which all have different forms of attacks, although the cats really suck to deal with. After taking some damage, you'll be brought into a narrow hallway that you'll have to break through, and once you're done with that, you'll be greeted with a slug coming out of a sarcophagus that shoots planets out of his eyes. Great! And then after that, we get to the part that made me laugh as hard as I did, the cuphead phase. After scanning your plane, Jimmy will turn into a hand that is puppeteering a version of yourself, accompanied by a replica pea shooter and Jimmy's own hat. It takes a lot to amuse me in games like this, but they did it pretty easily here. And finally, we get one more big face-off as three pyramids circle us while Jimmy shoots lasers out of his turban. This fight itself is relatively tame in this last phase, but the charm that we've seen up until this point makes up for that and I never even needed his wishes to help me. Up next is the boss where my opinion has recently dramatically shifted for the better. Originally, I thought that this boss was just okay, but I came to realize that I was very wrong about Beppy the Clown. So how exactly was I wrong? Well, to start, I really love his design, and the setting is beautifully well done, even if it does lead to a lot of visual distractions. And when it comes down to his personality, just like Jimmy, he's really messing around the whole time as is clear in his first and third phases. And then there's the fight itself. Starting off, Beppy rides in a bumper car as he dashes from one side of the track to the other, while shooting range ducks hang from the ceiling. Starting in phase 2, a roller coaster will periodically charge through the screen as Beppy sends up multiple balloon dogs. In phase 3, Beppy will ride a yellow or green carousel donkey that spits out horseshoes in either a sine wave or airdrop formation. And lastly, Beppy becomes the carousel as you jump from the ground onto rotating platforms, the roller coaster completely blazes across the track, and Beppy distributes penguins that throw slow balls at you. While Dr. Kyle was a chaotic and pretty messy fight, Beppy's fight is a perfect example of controlled chaos. The one thing that kind of holds it back though is the music. You may have noticed that I haven't brought it up every time, and the truth is it only serves as a way to give bonus points. So Beppy would likely be ranked higher, possibly even in the top 10, but his theme is one of the more mid-battle themes in the game. That's all I can really complain about, as now we've reached the bosses that really go over the top and deserve to be called the best in the game. And to think we still haven't reached the top 10 yet. There's one boss in particular that is heavily defined by his outstanding music, and it's a no-brainer, but honestly amazing how a flower could have easily the best music piece across the whole game. Cagney Carnation is one of the most famous bosses in this game, and for very good reason. First, just listen to this scene. I'll stop talking for a second. Pretty good, huh? And as for his design, it's simple, but very charming. And that dance that he does in the first phase. I can't dance that well, unless it's less than zero that's playing. I'm not too sure what his personality may be, but he's got some moves, and that's all I need to know. But as for the first phase, it's another great test for your skills at paying attention to multiple things at once, as each attack is dynamic and very different with its behavior. A crank shot that spits seeds into the air, each color color to show what it does, launching his face at you, and tossing a boomerang or lock on seeds from his magic hands. And yes, that attack is called magic hands. Also, those three platforms are going to be important, as in phase two, thorned vines cover the whole ground, meaning you'll need to jump on these platforms to not get spiked. The last phase isn't too crazy, but you'll need to stay moving so that you don't have vines sneak attack you on the platform you're standing on. This fight is partially carried by the music, but there's no doubt that it's still a fun and very fair fight, and a much better test of your skills than Ruby and Croaks. Now if only I could master the hand dance. While this next boss is a bit lacking in terms of challenge, the sheer silliness makes up for it. Venevemen may be commonly mispronounced, but he doesn't miss with anything else. In fact, we've reached a point where every boss manages to hit a home run with every main factor, especially the fight and music. Verna's design is easily one of the funniest in the game and ties into his personality perfectly. It's clear he was, or at least acts, like he was in the military, evident by his collection of makeshift trophies, and he certainly knows how to pilot mobile weapons, even if they look very impractical. Not to mention, Marine Corps is just a perfect theme for this fight. And then, there's the fight itself. In Phase 1, Verna pulls out a catapult that flings various bits of whatnots at you, a cannon that launches cherry bombs, and sometimes will throw two springs that you'll need to parry to avoid his Blitzkrieg attack. In the second phase, a row of bottle caps appear at both sides of the screen, which will randomly pop out as Verda himself raises and lowers himself with a flamethrower on both sides. 
And finally, after a serious malfunction, Verna gets swallowed by a cat that swipes at the ground, making debris fall from the ceiling, in addition to spitting out ghost mice for some reason. And upon knockout, oh, he was a robot all along. Well that's some bull. Either way, despite the fact that this fight isn't too hard, it's still incredibly fun regardless, although he may need to invest a bit more in the structural integrity of his machines. And we didn't even need EMP. When it comes to the aeroplane levels, it's clear which one is the fan favorite, and while she isn't my personal favorite, I respect the fact that Kala Maria is very likable. Although, I think that mostly just comes down to her design, and for others it tends to gravitate towards one thing in particular. The music is very enjoyable to listen to as well, but it's clear she isn't really happy with us being here. The fight itself is also very engaging, although it does have a habit of being a sheep in some places, which becomes more common as the fight goes on. The first phase starts with Kala calling Pufferfish, a seahorse, and a cannon-wearing turtle, which lingers for the next attack, which will either be Ghost Pirates, a Spreadshot, or a homing electric dolphin. After getting nommed on by a pair of eels, Kala turns into Medusa and gains a petrifying attack in combination with several spread shots from the eels. This is where some moments can get a little cheap, however, as it's likely impossible to avoid being petrified while you're focused on dodging the electric shots, so you could get petrified right in front of one and take a hit. And in the last phase, Kala's head breaks off as we follow her into the reef. Again, the petrifying attack can be an issue as you get hit right before a wall collides with you. Aside from that, however, this fight is visually one of the best in the game, and is overall very well done. Now how did Kala put herself back together after this? We've seen bosses fought on unstable ground up until this point, but very few bosses actually give you control of the platform itself, and that gimmick itself is what leads the Phantom Express to be such a fun fight across all four phases. The design for this boss is perfect for a spooky setting, and Railroad Wrath is one of the best composed pieces in the game, using heavy brass songs to represent the train's whistle. And judging by the death screens, I don't think we're allowed here, since this train is only for the dead. The fight itself revolves around this rickety cart that we control ourselves, but at most points in the fight we also have pumpkins and ghosts that can also tamper with our cart to really throw us off. The first phase starts off with the blind specter shooting mounting eyeballs out of his hands. No wonder he's blind. After taking him out, we then move up the train as we meet the conductor. Wait, that's not the conductor I know. Uh, anyway, he attacks by popping out one of three cars and slamming his hands down. After taking him out, we move along to the Blaze Brothers who spit lightning onto the track. But keep an eye out for the ghosts as they can drop a skull to mess with the cart. And lastly, we come up against the very head of the train as it detaches itself from the rest of the train and runs alongside you. You'll need to parry the tail to open its engine in order to reveal its heart, which is its weak spot, as a storm of embers falls out and bone rings are shot out of the train's nose. Every moment of this fight is engaging from start to finish as this is your final test before entering Inkwell Hell. Everything you've learned up until this point as you're on foot is used here, with a couple twists thrown in as well. Methinks we ended up on the wrong side of the tracks. From a purely visual standpoint, some bosses have fantastic changes in scenery or just simply have lots of eye candy in their moveset, but visually, no boss does it better than Mortimer Freeze. By design, he already looks great just in the first phase, and things only crank up as the fight goes on. Not to mention, Snow Cult Scuffle is easily one of my favorite music pieces in the whole game, and when it comes to his personality, it's not hard to see that he's in control here, and the audience in the background could very well have been tricked into joining his cult. And now, the fight. Starting off, Mortimer summons these icicle minions, throws tarot cards at you, and even pulls a freaking whale out of his hat and slams it into the ground. After taking some damage, Mortimer will call his snow golem, Jupiter, encasing his body in snow for phase 2. Jupiter can roll or jump across the arena, slam the ground to summon ice spikes, or turn into a fridge to spit out ice cubes, finishing off by summoning popsicle bats. And then, there's the last phase. After bursting out of Jupiter's body, you'll need to follow Mortimer up these platforms into a circle of five as you climb above the top of the Colosseum. Here, you're greeted with a beautiful Aurora Borealis as Mortimer the Snowflake sharpens his hands in preparation for the last phase. Here, as you jump between the rotating platforms, Mortimer will squeeze his eye out, summon 5 cent ice cream, and toss buckets that break apart when they hit the edge of the screen. Every point of this fight is absolutely beautifully done from start to finish, all rounded off with a fantastic music piece and easily one of the most fun fights in the game. Even the knockout is visually well done, as the snowflake melts away to show Mortimer having caught a cold. Poor guy. Ooh, lassie, do I have a story to tell. A story about the one who carries the desert limes. 
The very limes yet seek to bake the wonder touch. <coughs> Sorry, that was my best conductor impression. I can't keep this up for long. But anyway, easily one of the best aeroplane bosses just so happens to be a high speed chase through the desert as we hot foot it after Esther Winchester. This boss across all points is easily one of the most hectic in the whole game. Design wise, this literal cowgirl is just hilarious. Not to mention, the attention to detail was done flawlessly in this fight. Even down to small details like this wanted poster covering one of the windows of the saloon in the first phase, then falling off when Esther switches floors. And in terms of her personality, I'm a little bit puzzled. No doubt she is very childish, but I'm genuinely not sure what side she's on, since she's robbing the bank and appears to be a wanted bounty, but also has her own saloon that she works to tend regularly. So I'm a little puzzled, but not complaining. Not to mention, High Noon Hoopla is once again one of the best music pieces in the game. And now it's time to talk about this heck of a fight. In the first phase, Esther starts in the saloon as she fires snake oil, which curves back, and then lasts a huge cactus before switching floors, all the while a vulture drops dynamite and a donkey spits a thorn ball. In the second phase, Esther vacuums up the saloon and several bags of money with it, then spits out safes which break apart as they hit the ground. Then, after accidentally cooking herself alive and turning into sausages, she spits snakes at you while you navigate through cans of beans. Wait, beans? And then in the last phase, she retreats into a can of prairie dogs and shoots out two strings of sausages which crisscross, in addition to spitting out a spread of peppers. This entire fight is fast paced and the proper level of intensity, easily beating out other bosses like Dr. Kyle and Kala Maria, all with a fantastic level of charm and an outstanding music piece. Yeehaw! Okay, I can tell a lot of people are not going to be very happy with me on this one. But you all probably should have expected this if you were paying attention to the clues that have popped up a couple times throughout this video. At number 5, Grim Matchstick. Way too many people slander this guy because of their own skill issues, but in reality, Grim is both doing his job at being one of your two final tests for IL-2, while also unintentionally fighting you, and I'll talk about that shortly. Go on, call me a sucker. You're technically correct, but let me talk about why I love this goofy dirk so much. Firstly, this guy is adorable. Again, you can call me a sucker as much as you like. It won't make any difference in how much I love this precious boy. And also, I love the music for this fight, once again giving a feel of playfulness, which again, I'll talk about in a minute. As for the fight itself, you start on a series of cloud platforms that constantly move in one direction that's dependent on the difficulty you choose. Grim will start the fight by casting psychic rings or spitting out fireballs that snake up and down, all while his tail pops up to uppercut you. After taking some damage, Grim will circle around to then try to attack you from behind, and this is where people tend to blow their stacks on regular. Ever heard of the lobber? Anyway, Grim will unroll his tongue as a line of fire minions march along it, and some of those people will get ready to jump at you. It's a subtle cue, but if you're paying attention, which most people seem to forget to do here, you'll hear it coming and get ready to act accordingly. And in the last phase, Grim grows two more heads and the sunny weather turns into an intense thunderstorm. Grim will spit bubbles of fire that split apart if shot, which is countered by hitting the brakes for literally half a second. And occasionally, the middle head will turn into a flamethrower, which actually makes things a bit easier. So the fight is appropriately challenging, but what really puts him up here is his personality, and the truth behind what's actually happening here. Yes, he's defending his soul contract, but in reality, he's not actually trying to fight you. His death screen cards actually show this, as he says, Don't misunderstand my flames, I just meant fun and games. So it actually turns out that one of the more challenging and hectic fights ends up coming from the one boss whose last intention is to actually fight. Okay, now I'm probably playing defense a lot, but I will not give up the fact that Grim is an amazing boss, but one that is highly misunderstood because of the player's own skill issue. You want to reach aisle 3? Well if you can't best this guy, you're not ready. All of this leads Grim to easily be my favorite boss in the base game, or at least, of the ones fought on foot. So if Grim Matchstick is your final on-foot test before you can reach IO3, what about the airplane? Well, there's still one test left for you, and that is hosted by none other than Wally Warbles, my favorite shmup boss and my favorite boss from the base game. First things first, I absolutely love his design. A bird resting in a cuckoo clock is oddly one of the most fitting designs in the whole game, and his personality tells us that he will fight even in the most dire of situations. Not to mention, the theme for aviary action is very good. But now let's get into the fight itself. Starting off, Wally spits out eggs that break apart when they hit the edge of the screen and occasionally turns his head into a hand to fire a spread of three bullets. During this, lines of smaller birds will appear, giving you an easy parry. 
After taking some damage, Wally blows his whistle and then spends all of phase 2 flinging tons of feathers in all directions, then tiring out a bit to catch his breath to do it again. After falling out of his house, his son Willy Warbles comes out with a shield of spiked eggs as he flies around, occasionally getting a shot with his ray gun. And finally, after taking him out, Wally comes back, laying on a stretcher as he stomps out his heart and using an attack that is literally called Trash Talk. All the while, the paramedic birds carrying the stretcher spit out pills that split apart. Everything in this fight is engaging in an excellent test of your skills to make sure you're ready to move on to aisle 3, but one more thing that takes him farther for me is simply his refusal to actually die. Seriously, he took a ton of bullets and bombs from our plane, fell out of his house from a presumably serious height, and then spends the last moments of the fight being carried on a stretcher, then gets salted by the paramedics after he's knocked out, which would give a sign that he actually died in the end considering he's absent in the final cutscene. Though a dev has confirmed this to be false, which means that even after all of this, Wally is still alive. Now that's determination. By now you would have already figured out that my top 3 bosses all come from the delicious last course. And what better way to start off with the top 3 than with an action packed, intense, and quite literal dogfight. The Howling Aces may be a tricky fight, but there's no doubt that this scene is one of the most visually well done, on top of fantastic music and even more of a fantastic fight. And in terms of their designs, they're all very professional, even the Yankee Yippers. Although their personalities are all very different, with the Bulldog and Sergeant O'Fara both being very serious, while the Yankee Yippers are, uh, not. Now for the fight. Just like with the Phantom Express, you're on a manually controlled platform, and this time it's a plane that's controlled by standing on either side of it. Phase 1 begins with the Bulldog jumping out of his plane to shoot either yarn balls out of a cat, or use his own tattoos as weapons. And at the same time, the Yankee Yippers will toss a spread of tennis balls, and halfway through, the Chinook will fly by and fire a bunch of fire hydrant missiles. After the Bulldog is dropped out of this plane, the four Yankee Yippers will jump out and begin to circle around and bark at you. After each of them is taken out, Sergeant O'Fara will come by Inner Chinook and box you in, as you dodge various formations of lasers. But this last phase throws an almighty curveball in the fact that she can completely flip your screen around sideways and even upside down, which can really throw you off if you aren't ready for it. While the screen is sideways, she will also shoot out color-coded dog bowls before dusting your hands off and flipping you in another direction. This entire fight is intense from start to finish, and at no point does it ever get dull, on top of the fact that you'll need to stay focused the whole time to avoid getting thrown off. And one little extra detail, the pilot flying our plane is also the same guy who provides the tutorial for the airplane. This makes me think that this guy and the Howling Aces have some beef with each other. Not sure what it could be though, but it isn't the only time we'll see some beef between two characters that aren't us. In fact... Speaking of two of the characters that have beef with each other, since this game allegedly takes place in 1930, basing a boss fight off of Prohibition is just perfect, and it sets up this battle perfectly. Right away, this fight isn't actually you versus the boss. It was like that with Grimm, but he wasn't actually trying to fight. The Moonshine Mob, on the other hand, is actually fighting, but it's not you that they're fighting, it's the police. Throughout all phases of this fight, ant cops will come out and shoot pesticides or wield a baton simply due to the fact that it was illegal to sell alcohol in this time period. And as for the designs of the bosses themselves, it's not the most complicated, but sometimes simplicity is the answer. And their personality shows that they may even get some pleasure out of fighting the police, though it appears they have reformed in the end and now sell baking ingredients, although there is a suspicion that this may not actually be true. And we still haven't gotten to the fight yet. The first phase has Charlie Left Legs, yes that's his actual name, run back and forth across the three platforms, sometimes stopping to drop wet bombs, occasionally smacking a caterpillar that bounces around everywhere, or even calling in reinforcements in the form of flies. After taking him out, he lowers a lightning bug down, who dances around the middle platform while moonshine barrels and ant cops run on the top and bottom. However, deadly music will play as three of the sound waves turn from green to yellow and then to red, forcing you to run in a circle around it to avoid getting hit. And for the last phase, an anteater breaks through the top two platforms and sticks his trunk through both sides of the screen to grab a cluster of ants and flies, then spitting them out at you. Only the trunk takes damage, but once you're done with this, you're finished. Wait, nope, you're not done yet, as the snail will appear as the anteater's hat falls off, which will actually get you killed if you fall for the fake knockout. Every single element of this fight is extremely well done, from the setting, to the music, to the sheer craziness of the attacks across all three, and a half, phases of this fight. There's really no criticism that I have at all for this boss fight, but there is still one left to talk about.
So, what happens when you combine a well fleshed out personality, a simple yet effective design, awesome music, and a fight that is done perfectly when it comes to difficulty and fairness? Well, you get what is my favorite boss in all of Cuphead, Chef Saltbaker. After collecting all of the Wonder Tart ingredients, we come back here only to find one of our friends got captured, and now we need to break them out. Saltbaker himself actually has a pretty likable design, just being a normal human, but made out of glass, and with a chef hat that resembles the top of a salt shaker. And while he was pretty nice in the beginning, it's clear he seems even more sinister than the devil, which is played out perfectly in this fight. This is a true final boss fight, easily the hardest in the entire game both to beat and get an S rank, and it's also fit with a theme perfect for a final boss, baking the wonder tart. And to start off, Saltbaker will break a sugar cube, squeeze a basket of strawberries, roll out dough for animal cookies, and slice up limes, all of which behave very differently with their attacks. But those with keen eyes will notice something. All four of these attacks are actually the ingredients that you previously got from the other five bosses in Isle 4. The gnome berries from Glumps of the Giant, the distillery dough from the Moonshine Mob, the icy sugar cubes from Mortimer Freeze, and the desert limes from Esther Winchester. It's a chaotic first phase only made more so by the flame on the ceiling. In the second phase, we're scooped up into his hand as we now need to shoot these pepper shakers, which will make them smack Saltbaker in the face as he tosses up the pineapple mint leaves, and the flame now moves to the floor. After getting hit by a pepper shaker one too many times, Saltbaker breaks apart and kind of spills his innards everywhere. At least it's just salt. Anyway, phase 3 has him make two copies of himself that bounce around the arena while saw blades just grind up the floor. And finally, the final phase has him release his heart to bounce around two tornadoes of salt as pieces of his own glass body fall from the ceiling, wrapping up what is easily the most intense and satisfying fight in the entire game. And it doesn't even end there. The end cutscene even shows how Saltbaker cared about his bakery more than anything, even having full control over the astral plane. So, after his sentence to community service, Saltbaker immediately worked to rebuild his bakery from the ground up, leading to a happy ending for everyone. With the devil, we just kinda beat him up, but Saltbaker chose to make his comeback after the fight, and it couldn't have ended any better. Well, after a lot of preparation, this list is finally complete, and I couldn't be much happier with it. Yeah, there were some controversial choices on this list, but that's something to be expected from just about anyone who makes lists like these. And regardless of this, this entire list was a blast to make. And of course, if you enjoyed it, then please be sure to leave a like and comment Prairie Dogs down below so I know you made it to the end of the video. If you want to see more from me in the future, then please consider to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new uploads. My next list will be the top 10 best plants in Plants vs. Zombies, which I'm very excited to do. And of course, if you have a difference of opinion, then feel free to share it in a nice way in the comments below. That will be it for me for this video, I will see you next time. Farewell.